beautiful people. Hope you all doing well. So today we are diving into the grand finale of our series on Dr. Abdus Salam's Nobel Prize. The controversy surrounding his work, allegations of plagiarism from Sir Kesar Ahmed Raja and Norman Dombe, and the intricate web of scientific politics. In this concluding episode, we will thoroughly examine the papers of all three laureates and uncover some additional findings. So, let's get started with this exciting session. Before we delve into the detailed examination of the Nobel Prize winning papers, let's take a moment to address Dr. Rahman's critique. Dr. Rahman's challenged Sir Kassar's assertion that Salam's work was merely uh, a replication, contending and so that the original ideas were indeed introduced by Salam and Ward. So, to set the stage, we will first explore Salam and Ward's 1959 paper, which focused on the intricate topic of the three spin one field. This will provide crucial context uh, as uh, we unravel the contribution of these pioneering scientists. I would also like to give uh, a historical context and scientific contributions for the same theory. Building on firework. Like all scientific research, Salam and Ward's paper did not emerge in isolation. The build on the foundational work of others, such as the development of quantum electrodynamics and the study of weak interactions. Key contributions from scientists like Enrico Fermi, who developed the first theory of beta decay and Julian Schwenger, Richard Finman, and Tomonaga Shinichiro, who developed QD work critical. Uh, I would give credit to Salam and Ward's uh, specific contribution uh, because Salam and Ward's uh, paper of 1959 was significant because it introduced novel ideas about uh, gauge uh, invariance and symmetry principle in the context of weak interactions. Their work highlighted the potential for unifying weak and electromagnetic interactions, providing conceptual and mathematical tools that were crucial for later developments. I would also like to mention here that this paper wasn't done uh, individually uh, from Salam, Dr. Salam. Uh, it was a combined effort of uh, Salam and Ward. Whereas it had some limitations, which I could tell you that uh, was a sort of incomplete model, uh, provided important conceptual insight, but their paper didn't present a complete and testable model of electroweak unification. Uh, their work was more about establishing the theoretical foundation uh, than providing a specific uh, detailed model. A lack of prediction also, there was a problem uh, because the paper didn't predict new particles or provide a mechanism for simulation, which uh, are crucial components of, uh, you know, of a complete electroweak. So now time to talk about uh, Glashow's paper, uh, 1961. Uh, if uh, major contributions are talked about, uh, that the paper had a specific uh, model, Glashow's paper proposed a concrete model that unified the weak and electromagnetic interactions using the SU2 into U1 gauge uh, symmetry. And this was a significant uh, step forward from the more abstract and conceptual work of Salam and Ward. It had prediction of W and Z bosons. So, you know, Glashow's model predicted that the existence of W and Z bosons, uh, which are the carriers of the weak force, and this prediction provided a clear, testable outcome that could be investigated experimentally. This paper had some more points, as, for example, inclusion of quarks. So, Glashow's model incorporated the concept of quarks explaining their behavior under weak interactions. This was a critical step in developing a comprehensive understanding of particle physics. Uh, it had another point, which is mechanism for symmetry breaking. 
While Glashow's initial paper did not fully develop the mechanism for symmetric rating, it laid the groundwork for the later inclusion of the Hitz mechanism by Salam and Weinberg. More importantly, if I talk about the strength of this paper, which is concrete and testable, Glashow's model provided specific prediction that could be tested experimentally, making it a crucial step towards a complete electroweak theory. Foundational for electroweak theory and his work directly built upon by Salam and Weinberg, who incorporated the Higgs mechanism to explain how particles uh, acquire mass, uh, leading to the complete fo formulation of the electroweak theory. And if I compare uh, Glashow's paper with uh, Salam and Ward's 1959 paper, uh, I, I could come up with the conclusion that the scope and depth of Salam and Ward's paper was more about uh, establishing a theoretical foundation and exploring the potential for unifying weak and electromagnetic interaction. But Glashow's paper, on the other hand, presented a specific testable model the, uh, that entirely uh, that directly led to the electroweak theory. And predictive power of uh, Glashow's paper had clear prediction such as existence of W and Z bosons, which were later confirmed experimentally. The predictive power was a significant advantage over the more abstract framework of Salam and Ward. And Glashow's work provided the critical building blocks that were essential for the final development of the electroweak theory. Moreover, Salam's and Ward's contribution were foundational and influential in establishing the theoretical principle is uh, necessary for unification. Glashow's work built directly on these principles providing a specific and testable model that was essential for the final formulation of the electroweak theory. And both contributions were crucial, but Glashow's work is more directly associated with the specific structure and prediction of the electroweak theory as we understand it today. As Dr. Rahman also mentioned about Slam and Ward papers of 1964, and for that I also want to give some. Now I would like to talk on Glashow's 1961 paper, which was published earlier, and after that, you know. Uh, in 1964, Salam and Ward published uh, their paper, which was again going to be noted that wasn't an individual work, it was again a combined work of Dr. Salam and Ward's paper, uh, which was published in 1964, building upon Glashow's paper of 1961. So, point to be clear that Salam and Ward's 1964 paper followed Glashow's work and built upon the idea of using SU2 into the one gay symmetry, further developing the theoretical framework. And if I'd say, uh, and I would be wrong saying that Glashow's 1961 model was more concrete and provided specific prediction uh, as compared to Salam and Ward's 1964 paper, which contributed to the theoretical development, but did not offer as concrete and testable predictions at uh, Glashow's earlier work. And so to speak, it is common in scientific research for later works to build upon earlier foundational ideas. Salam and Ward's 1964 paper can be seen, if I just say, as an extension and further development of concept initially presented by Glashow's in 1961. Now, point to be noted, uh, was Salam and Ward's 1964 paper copying Glashow's work? I think uh, it would not be accurate or fair to say that Salam and Ward copied Glashow's work because in science, it's normal for researchers to build upon each other's ideas and contributions. But it is not wrong to say that Glashow's 1961 paper actually introduced the SU2 into U1 gauge symmetry idea uh, for unifying weak and electromagnetic interactions, uh, which made specific predictions about W and Z bosons, and included quarks providing a concrete 
and testable model. Though Salam and Ward's 1964 paper built upon Glashow's foundational ideas, further developing the theoretical framework for electoral. I would also like to talk a little bit about Steven Weinberg's paper of 1967 and uh, the key contribution if I just say uh, that incorporation of Higgs mechanism uh, to break the SU2 into U1 gay symmetry spontaneously and this explains how particles acquire mass, a critical component missing in previous model of Glashow's. And uh, predictive power of Weinberg model, like Glashow's predicted uh, the existence of the W and Z bosons and included the photon. So meaning like it was built upon, uh, again, of Glashow's paper. However, the inclusion of Higgs me mechanism provided a more complete and realistic model. It had some more key features as well, uh, like renormalizability, uh, that uh, his theory, uh, you know, that uh, electroweak theory could be renormalizable, uh, meaning that it could uh, make the finite uh, precise predictions at all energy scales. Uh, lastly, unification of weak and electromagnetic forces, uh, that his model further unified the weak and electromagnetic interactions in a comprehensive manner providing a robust theoretical framework that could be experimentally tested. In comparison of uh, Flashels and Steven Weinberg paper, uh, similarities would be the same, like uh, let's say gauge symmetry. Both papers used the SG2 into U1 gauge symmetry as the foundation for unifying the weak and electromagnetic interaction. W and Z bosons, both models predicted the existence of W and Z bosons, uh, which are mediation of the electroweak and quark inclusion. Both models included quarks contributed to a better understanding of particle interactions. Differences, uh, like, you know, if I just say that the most significant difference uh, is Weinberg's inclusion of Higgs mechanism. Uh, this explained how particles acquire mass through a spontaneous symmetry breaking, addressing a key issue that Glashow's model didn't uh, fully resolve. And uh, renormalizability, Weinberg's model provided a clear path to renormalizability, which was crucial for making finite and precise predictions uh, at different energy scales. Uh, this was a major advancement uh, over earlier models. And finally, theoretical completeness that Weinberg paper presented a more complete and realistic, you know, uh, theoretical framework by incorporating the Higgs mechanism, which made the model not only theoretical appealing, but also experimentally. Now, uh, to compare Abdul Salam's 1968 paper with the earlier work of Charles and Glasher's 1961 and Steven Weinberg's 1967 paper, we need to look uh, at how Salam's contribution aligned with what diverged from the ideas presented in the previous papers. So here is a detailed analysis. Some contributions of the 1968 paper of Dr. Abdul Salam's that the incorporation of Higgs mechanism, like Weinberg, uh, Salam incorporated the Higgs mechanism to explain how particles acquire mass through spontaneous symmetry breaking of the SU2 and U1 uh, gauge symmetry. Electroweak unification that Salam's work further solidified the unification of weak and electromagnetic in interaction under the SU2 into U1 gauge symmetry fr uh, framework. The third point is renormalizability. Salam also demonstrated that the electroweak theory with the inclusion of Higgs mechanism could be renormalizable and this was crucial for making the theory mathematically consistent and experimentally viable. Um, and last but not the least, it was an independent uh, development. Uh, although Salam's contribution closely mirrored those of Weinberg, but his work was uh, developed independently. In summary, the purpose of uh, doing a lot more research on uh, those uh, lawyers' papers and uh, purpose of making video 
like the conclusion, if I just say my whole analysis of the research, uh, what I found that uh, Plaza's work laid the essential groundwork. Uh, both Weinberg and Slam independently then completed the electroweak theory by incorporating the Higgs mechanism and ensuring its renormalizability. Uh, this collective effort, if I'd say, resulted in a robust and experimentally testable framework for the unification of weak and electromagnetic interactions. Undoubtedly, it is essential to recognize that Dr. Abdul Salam was a passionate mathematician who seized the opportunity to enhance Glashow's mathematical framework. However, we must also acknowledge the foundational contributions of Glashow himself, whose uh, pioneering work laid the crucial groundwork for the unification of weak and electromagnetic um, interactions, establishing the very first building blocks of uh, uh, this groundbreaking. So that is all for now, and I will see you guys next time. Until you take good care of yourselves, and bye bye.